Let's dispel another myth today. Most mainstream financial advisors propose that gold is a terrible investment and has no place in a person's portfolio. Even among those who believe that gold is a legitimate asset class, you'll find very few who will recommend that more than 10 to 20% of your net worth should be in gold. So why this aversion to gold? Prior to 1873, a person who saved in dollars held fixed claims to silver payable upon demand. Up through 1933, a person who saved in dollars held fixed claims to gold payable on demand. Even up through 1971, the dollar was linked to precious metals. So for most of U.S. history, a person who simply saved in dollars was in effect saving in precious metals. So why would it be considered prudent for most of U.S. history to allocate up to 100% of your wealth in dollars, and thus precious metals, and yet for the last 45 years, it's considered foolish to devote more than 20% to precious metals? The metals themselves haven't changed. They're still the same as they've ever been. It's the dollar that's changed in its nature over time. So what about the financial experts and their advice? They claim that the metals are just too volatile, and so a portfolio should not contain any more than about 20%, if it holds any at all. Does their advice serve your best interest? As usual, I'd prefer to debate the issue using data rather than rhetoric, so let's dive in and see what the data tells us. A common way that financial experts illustrate the trade-off between risk and return is to show a particular asset class on a chart with the x-axis showing risk and the y-axis showing average return. Typically the measure of risk is the standard deviation of returns, which is a measure of how predictable returns will be from one year to the next. And typically it is the variability in yearly returns that is chosen. I don't like this approach. Firstly, one year is too short a period of time. If a person is going to need to spend from their portfolio a year from now, then they really have no business putting their money into something like stocks or long-term bonds. So I prefer to look at risk from the standpoint of what can be expected to happen over time periods of five years or longer. Another objection I have to using variability of returns as a measure of risk is that most investors wouldn't treat the possibility of an abnorm abnormally high return on investment as being risky. So what I prefer to do is characterize risk as the worst expected loss. In this chart, I have plotted various asset classes in terms of how they have performed over the past century. I've included one-year fixed income, large U.S. stocks, small U.S. value stocks, and international value stocks. I've also included gold, the investment industry's least favorite asset class. The x-axis represents the worst total return an investor would have seen if he or she held the asset class for five years at a time over the past century. Note that I'm basing returns in dollars and I'm not adjusting for inflation. But that's okay, because the point I will make in this video doesn't require that such an adjustment be made. So we can see that there was a point in time where an investor in large U.S. stocks would have lost half of his or her portfolio as measured in dollars over a five-year period of time. The holder of gold at one time lost 46% of his or her dollar value over the worst five-year holding period. Even the holder of one-year treasuries lost some value over the worst five-year period. Remember, during parts of the Great Depression, short-term treasury yields were actually negative. We can also see that stocks have had the highest average annual return over the past century. Large U.S. stocks, on average, in dollar terms, have returned about 9% per year. Gold has returned close to 5. One-year treasuries have returned about 4% in dollar terms, which is not even as good as gold. So let's combine these assets in different proportions and see what happens. Typically what financial experts do when they show the risk and return of various asset allocations is they vary the percentage of a risky but high-returning asset class such as stocks and the percentage of a low-risk asset such as fixed income, which acts as the bedrock of the portfolio. Now, I'm a little tongue-in-cheek when I say low risk because I don't personally believe that one-year treasuries are the risk-free asset. It's just what the financial industry has chosen as risk-free because of how they've chosen to define risk. But let's use dollar-based risk anyway because it will be fun using their flawed dollar-centric definitions and still proving that gold is better than bonds in a portfolio. So I've plotted on this chart in blue a curve showing traditional asset allocations. On one side of the blue curve, we have 100% stocks. For the stock portion, I've taken a blend of equal parts small U.S. value, large U.S. stocks, 
and international value stocks. On the other side, we have a 100% position in one-year treasuries. Every point in between is a different allocation of fixed income versus stocks. The gray curve is different. I've taken the same equity mix, but instead of adding various amounts of treasuries as the bedrock of the portfolio, I've added various amounts of gold. So at the top left of the curve, we have a 100% equity position, and at the other end of the curve, we have 100% gold. Now, if you're a person who's interested in saving and minimizing the possibility of long-term loss, the points that will be of greatest interest to you are the points on the extreme right of each curve. These are the minimum risk points. Note here that the least risky point on the blue curve is 100% treasuries. Not too surprising. The least risky point for the gold and stock mix is 80% gold and 20% stocks. With this allocation, you'll be taking some risk. The holder of this allocation at one time saw a five-year dollar loss of 23%. At the same time, though, the portfolio rewarded the holder with an average annual dollar gain of 7% per year, which isn't too bad. Notice that the portfolio made up of 60% treasuries and 40% stocks is actually riskier than the portfolio that has 80% gold and 20% stocks, and the annual return isn't much higher. And for a conventional financial expert, a portfolio consisting of 40% stocks and 60% fixed income is considered to be very, very conservative. And yet, the portfolio with the heavy gold allocation is less risky. But the real magic starts to happen when we extend our time horizon and consider the long-term risk. Let's consider what happened to the investor who held various mixes of these asset classes for 10 years at a time. Again, I've shown a blue curve as a conventional portfolio consisting of various amounts of stocks and fixed income. The gray curve is a mixture of stocks and gold. So what's the first thing that jumps off the page at you? If you're a saver and don't like losses, then the first thing that you'll notice is that the highest returning points on the gray curve are to the right of the highest returning points on the blue curve. In other words, the portfolios that have gold are better than the portfolios that hold fixed income from a risk and reward standpoint. If we want to minimize our risk of loss over a 10-year holding period, then the way to do so is with a portfolio consisting of 60% gold and 40% stocks. Over the past century, this portfolio has had an average dollar-based rate of return of 8.5% per year, and the worst 10-year performance was a total return of 34%. In other words, a 60% gold and 40% stock portfolio never had a loss over any 10-year period of the past century. To get the same kind of annual returns, the conventional portfolio would need to contain 50% stocks and 50% fixed income. Yet the worst 10-year performance of that portfolio would have been a 12% uh, total return, or 20% less than the gold-based portfolio. Things are starting to get a little fun, huh? Let's see what happens over 20-year stretches of time. Again, our blue curve represents mixes of stocks and fixed income. Our gray curve represents mixes of stocks and gold. What we can see here is that portfolios that contain up to 65% gold performed better on a risk-adjusted return basis than conventional portfolios that contain 50% or less fixed income. Now this is very interesting because most financial planners recommend to retired people that they hold a 50-50 mix of stocks and fixed income in retirement to have a safe portfolio that beats inflation. Many pension funds hold the same allocation. Yet the portfolios that hold a mixture of gold and stocks perform better. They have higher returns and they are safer from the standpoint of protecting against long-term dollar-based losses. But the most interesting thing that we can take away is that the claim that nobody should put more than 20% of their portfolio in gold just doesn't hold water from a historical standpoint. Whether we look at risk in, in terms of maximum losses over 5 years, 10 years, or 20 years, the data itself suggests that 50 to 80% gold is the best bet. It's the stock portion that should be smaller than the gold portion. The data also tells us that from the standpoint of risk-adjusted returns, gold is a better asset than fixed income. So maybe it's time to rethink what's taken as conventional wisdom today and treat gold as the wealth reserve asset that it is.